Taking ownership of our lives can be difficult, but with help from God, we can become proper stewards. This is the fifth message in the series, Recover. This message is entitled, Own. Here is Pastor Dale O'Shields. Welcome to Church of the Redeemer. We're so glad to have you with us this weekend. If you're with us for the very first time, welcome. Glad to have you with us. If you'll notice on the screen, there's a place where you can connect. Encourage you to let us know a little bit more about you. Also, there's a meet and greet at the end of today's service. So make sure you're a part of that. If you're a regular, welcome back. It is so good to be together in our time of worship. Well, today we're going to walk right into the Word of God. So go ahead and grab your Bibles and take a look at the notes there on your screen. You'll find them available for you. And let's continue our series together called Recover. I'm excited about the message I'm going to share with you this weekend. I believe it's going to be a life-changing message for your life, and let's come together in expectation of what God's going to say to us for these next few moments. You know, we are into a brand new year. We've been talking about what God is saying to us in the year 2021, coming out of 2020, and what a year that was, and now looking ahead to 2021 and what God is going to do in our lives in this year and in the years to come. As I told you, I was praying several weeks back about the messages that I would share with you at the beginning of a brand new year and asking God, God, what is the word that you want to speak to our lives for this year? And I felt so strongly that one simple word that I'm sharing with you in this series, and the word was the word recover. That word recover is a very powerful, significant word. It is a word that literally means to get back what was lost, to get back what was stolen, or to get back what has been forfeited in our lives. I'll say that again. To recover something is to get back something that you have lost, you recovered it, or to get back something that was stolen, stolen property, you recover it, or to get back something that you forfeited in your life, that by reason of something maybe that you did or something that happened in your life, you, you, you missed out on something or forfeited something of value and worth. And God said, this is the year, I believe, the year of recovery. It is a year to recover. And I believe that we could certainly preach this message any time, any year, because God is the God of recovery. And God gives us promises of recovery in our lives. Now, here's the beautiful thing about God, that when he brings recovery to your life, he doesn't just bring you back. A lot of us would say, hey, that'd be great if I could just get back some of the things that I've lost or some of the things that have been stolen from me, if you will, by the adversary, by the devil, or maybe if I could just get back some things that have forfeited. If I could just get them back, that would be wonderful. But here's how God goes above and beyond anything we could imagine. He doesn't just bring things back. He doesn't just bring us back. He brings us back to better. Why don't you say that phrase with me, back to better better, that God's plan for your life is not get to just simply get you back to where you were. He wants to bring you back to better. It is called recovery. It's God's recovery plan. Now, in this recovery plan of God, we have some responsibility. It's not something that God does only for us. We work together with God by, by taking certain steps in the journey, by cooperating with Him, by utilizing some keys that are vital to the recovery process. And I've been sharing with you some of the the keys. We're looking at seven keys of recovery. I talked the first week about the key of repentance, how it's important for us to come to that place of turning back to God again and and letting go of our past and turning from those things that might be destructive in our lives and, and repenting. Repentance is a valuable part of the recovery process. We've called it the own ramp to recovery. You'll never get on the highway of recovery without repentance. Then we talked about expectation, learning to expect that God is able to do what he promises to do. It's called faith. That we come to God believing that no matter what our life has been or what our life is, that God has the ability, the capacity, and the willingness to bring recovery to us. It's called expecting God to work in your life. God wants us to expect to have a hope for our future. And then last weekend, we talked about commitment the importance of making the right commitments along the pathway. Because if you and I don't make commitments to a recovery process, we'll never experience recovery. You have to be committed to it. It's not something that's just sort of haphazardly happening in your life. But there's certain commitments that lead you to this pathway. And by the way, if you've missed any of these messages, I would really recommend that you go back to our website at church-redeemer.org and all the past messages are there for you. Just simply download them and take time to review them again. Even if you've listened to them or you're part of it before, go back and review them again. These are the three steps. Now, I'm going to bring us today to the fourth step of recovery. We're going to unveil for us today what I believe is vital, a vital key, a vital step 
to being able to experience recovery in our life, and that's the word own. You and I need to own some things if we're going to experience real recovery. I want to talk about this topic of ownership and share with you three very important things to remember about this ownership step. What is it all about? What are we to do? And what does it involve in our recovery process? Let me share with you these three things. The first thing that you and I need to remember is this. Very simple, very plain, but yet very important. You and I need to understand, we need to grasp that your life is your life. My life is my life, and your life is your life. What I mean by that, and I could say it a different way, Way. Your life is your responsibility. Now, let me share some things about life with you for a moment from God's perspective. Life really is a precious gift that has been given to you by God. Human life is a gift of God. It should always be treated with respect and honor because the gift of life is a precious gift that comes from God himself. Going all the way back to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, listen to this origin of human life. Then God said, let us, speaking out about the Trinity, the Godhead, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Verse 27, so God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. That is, we as human beings are creations of of God. Life is precious. Human life is a gift from God. Chapter 2 of the same book of Genesis again references this reality. Verse 7, Genesis 2, then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And so we owe our life to God. Our life is a gift to us from God. The second thing I want you to understand about life and the value of it and that your life is your responsibility is, yes, it's something that God has given to us, but also God knows us and loves us, every one of us. You as a person, he knows you and he loves you. You're known by God and loved by God. Not only does God create, has God created you, but God knows who you are and God loves you. God cares deeply for you. Psalm 86 verse 15, but you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, notice this, abounding in love and faithfulness. So yes, God created us, but yes, he didn't just create us and sort of dump us on the planet earth. He created us and he continues to love us. He abounds in love toward us. Paul the Apostle in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 and 5 talks to us about this love of God directed toward all humanity, but because of his great love for us, notice that, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead and transgressions, it is by grace you've been saved. Talking to believers, he's describing for them the, the movement, the, 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 the outreaching arms of the love of God to humanity, to you and me. So human life is a gift. It's not just sort of a gift that God places us on the planet and then leaves us. No, he loves us. And then God has a purpose because he loves us. God has a purpose for every person. You may not feel like that there's a purpose for your life, but I want you to know that there is a purpose for your life. He has a purpose for you. He placed you here for a reason. You're not just living on planet Earth, taking up oxygen, air, if you will, breathing, living life, and sort of here I live, and then now eventually I die, and I had no reason for being. No, there is a purpose for your life. You're a gift from God. Your life is. He loves you, and he's given you a purpose. Jeremiah 29, 11, one of my favorite verses as perhaps yours as well. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you. Did you hear that today? I know the plans I have for you. He's talking to you. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Notice the you references there. It's personal, a personal purpose. Jeremiah 1, 5. Jeremiah is hearing the voice of God calling him. And here's what God says to Jeremiah. He says it to you as well. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. That is, Jeremiah said, God had a purpose for my, for my life even when I was in my mother's womb. David, the, David the, the, the psalmist declares in Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit them together in my mother's womb. 
thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. It is amazing to think about. Your workmanship is marvelous and how well I know it. So God has given us the gift of life. He loves us. He has a purpose for us. But here's the key thing to remember. We are stewards of the life God has given to us. Let's talk about that word stewardship for a moment. Maybe you know the word, perhaps you're not familiar with the word, but a a steward is a manager. A steward is someone who's responsible for what has been entrusted to them. A steward is a trustee, if you will. Something has been given to them to manage, to oversee, to have responsibility for, to take care of in a positive way, to manage well, to be a blessing to whatever has been given. And you and I are responsible for what we do with this precious gift of life that God has given to each one of us. We are responsible for what we do in response to the love that God has shown to us. We're responsible for what we do with the purpose God has imparted to our lives. We are stewards of the life that God has given to us. And what we make of our lives is determined by our choices. We bear responsibility for our choices. You and I are responsible for how we live our lives. So your life is your life. Your life is your responsibility. I'm going to add more to that in just a moment. Then the fifth thing to remember here about the life that God has given to you is that God is going to hold you accountable for your life, not someone else's life. You're not going to be held responsible for anybody else. You're only going to be held responsible for what you do with your life. Your life is your own. You have to stand eventually before God, and you have to give an account count to God for how you handled the gift that he gave you. How did you steward the life God gave you? How did you manage the life God gave you? What kind of ownership did you show over the life that God gave you? Now, this is vital because how you treat something you own is very, it tells a lot about you. There's a lot of folks that would identify perhaps with this. When you go and rent a car, uh, a car that's rented, you generally don't take it in for an oil change. You don't run it by the car wash before you take it back. You don't change the tires. You don't do anything to the car. You rent the car. You use it. You dump it back at the car dealership, wherever you rented it from, or car a rental uh, office, and you just used it without any sense of management over it. But the car you own is very different. There's a different set of responsibilities for what is yours compared to what doesn't really belong to you. And one One day, all of us are going to stand before God and give an account of what we did with our lives. Listen to these verses. Romans 14, verse 12. Therefore, each one, notice that statement, each one must answer for himself and give give a personal account of his own life before God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we, that is believers, will be called to account and must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or bad, that is, each will be held responsible for his actions, purposes, goals, motives, the use or misuse of his time, opportunities, and abilities. That's the amplified version. First Peter 4, verse 5. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So let's take a look at this again human life? Where does it come from? Your life. Where did your life come from? It is a gift given to you by God. That gift given to you by God is directed to you in love. He loves you. He has a purpose for your life. There's something that he wants to do through you. You and I are stewards of the life that God has given to us, and one day we're going to stand before him and give an account for how we manage our life. How do we steward our life? What kind of ownership that we show over our lives. And if you and I are going to recover, we have to realize that our life is our life. It is our responsibility. No one else is responsible for how we live. We are responsible before God for our own lives. You can't use other people as an excuse. You're not going to stand before God and give an account for somebody else's life. You and I will stand before God and give an account of our lives in relationship to Him. Now, the second point is also extremely important, simple but important. Recovery in your life requires overcoming the obstacles to ownership. I'll explain that in a moment. If you're going to recover, you've got to overcome some obstacles that get in the way of being a good steward. 
You have to overcome some obstacles that get in the way of the kind of ownership that you need to have for your life. It would seem that that ownership for your life would be basically a a no-brainer. You would think, well, certainly, yeah, I, I get that. But unfortunately, a lot of people really don't get it. What happens in a lot of people's lives in all of our lives at some point in time, it certainly has happened in mine, and I'm sure it's probably happened in yours as well. There are times that things get in the way of you being a good steward, or you being a good manager, or you being a good owner of your life. There are lots of things that, that, that sort of cloud our perspective, things like blame and anger and bitterness and resentment, and we could create a list of a variety of other things that get into our thinking, and suddenly we're not managing our life the way that we need to because we've got obstacles that need to be removed, things that need to be overcome. I'm going to give you an example of two men in the Scriptures that help us to see how two different people dealt with issues in their life. We're going to go back to the Old Testament and look actually at the first two kings in the nation of Israel, Saul, King Saul, and King David. They're a study in contrast. If you ever have the opportunity to do so, I'd highly recommend that you do a, a character study of Saul and David, very, two, two very different individuals. Both made mistakes in their life, but they both dealt with their mistakes very differently. They handled their life in a very different way. One was was irresponsible in the way that he handled his life, and and the other handled his mistakes in a responsible way. And so we're going to look at these two examples. Let's start with the first king, Saul. He was the very first king of Israel. And Saul had an up-and-down relationship with God, and it sort of culminates in 1 Kings, excuse me, 1 Samuel chapter 15. You can read this whole passage if you'd like to later on. Let me talk to you about what happens there. The Amalekites were enemies of Israel, and, and they were very wicked people, and they'd become so wicked that it was time to really deal with them aggressively. And so God, through the prophet Samuel, told Saul to take his army and to destroy all the Amalekites, every person to wipe them out because of the wickedness that was perpetuated through that particular nation. And so God says, everybody, get rid of them. Everything, get rid of the king. Everybody, everything. I want you to clear them out. And God had given Saul very clear, distinct instructions as to what he was to do. There was no way to confuse at all what what God had told Saul to do through the mouth of the prophet and the priest Samuel. And so Samuel gives him these instructions. But what happened was Saul decided, instead of doing what God had asked him to do, to sort of modify it a little bit. He decided that he wanted to do part of what God asked him to do, but he was going to change a little portion of it, actually a significant portion of it, and do some of what he wanted to do as well. So he is about to mess up. And so Saul didn't do what he was instructed to do. He made, And then when he was confronted by Samuel, he refused to accept responsibility for what he he had done, he p- passed the blame on to others. Let me read for you a portion of the story in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 12 through 15. Early in the morning, he, that's Samuel the prophet, went out to find Saul. Someone said that he'd gone to Mount Carmel to erect a monument to himself and had then gone on to Gilgal. That's another message in and of himself. It tells you a lot about Saul by reason of the fact that he wants to erect a monument to himself. Verse 13. When Samuel finally found him, Saul greeted him cheerfully. Hello there, he said. Well, I've carried out the Lord's commands. These are the words of Saul. Hello there, Samuel. By the way, hey, I've done everything God told me to do. And notice Samuel's response. I love this response. Then what was all the bleeding of sheep and lowing of oxen I heard? See, God had told him to destroy even all the animals. And so as soon as Samuel comes up, Saul says, Hi, Samuel, so good to see you. I did everything you told me to do. And Samuel says, Oh, you did? Why am I hearing all those sheep bleeding and those cattle uh, making noises? Why am I hearing all the sounds of animals if you, if you said you did everything God told you to do? And then verse 15, now Saul comes back. You would, think him, you would think he would say, you know, Samuel, you're right. I really didn't do everything I should have done. But notice what he says in verse 15. It's true that the army spared the best of the sheep and oxen, Saul admitted. But... Notice the the but there, it's a huge word, but they're going to sacrifice him to the Lord your God, and we have destroyed everything else. So he's now making excuses. Well, we kept, we 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 didn't we didn't kill those animals because because we're gonna do something different. We're gonna sacrifice them to God. God never asked that. 
He told him very clearly to destroy all that was a part of the Amalekites. Verse 19 of the same chapter. Then why didn't you obey the Lord, Samuel's asking. Why did you rush for the loot and do exactly what God said not to? Why did you do this thing that's opposite to what God said for you to do? Verse 20, but I have obeyed the Lord, Saul insisted. I did what he told me to do, and I brought King Agag, but killed everyone else. And it was only when my troops demanded it that I let them keep the best of the sheep and loot to sacrifice to the Lord. Here's what I want you to see. The point is, is that we're responsible for our lives. Your life is your life, and we're responsible, each one of us, for our lives. And there are things that get in the way of us being the responsible stewards that we need to be. And this is what happened to Saul. Here was Saul in this situation where God had very clearly instructed him to, to do a certain set of things. And, and Saul didn't do everything God asked him to do, but he had some excuses. He blamed his soldiers. He said, I'm going to use this for another purpose. I'm going to use these, these animals that you told me this to, to put to death. I'm going to now take them and sacrifice them to God. And later on, the Lord says to him through Samuel, obedience is better than sacrifice. And so the story is so, so apl uh, applicable to you and me. He was a man that refused to accept responsibility for disobeying God. And because of this, what happened was, is that God removed him from king of Israel. He eventually loses his place, his role in Israel. He becomes a madman by, by the time he comes to the end of his life. Why? Because he didn't manage his life well. He did not respond to God's dealing in his life. God doesn't demand our perfection. We're not all, and none of us are perfect, but he wants us to respond well when he deals with things in our lives. And that's what brings us to King David. King David made his share of mistakes as well. We could talk about all the different things that David didn't do right. He did some, some things that were wrong in his life. But one thing is very clear and very distinct from King Saul. When David realized he did wrong, he took it to God and owned up to his mistakes. And when he did, God got him back on the right track again. Because Saul was not willing to address the issues in his life. He was removed as king. But David... He was willing to deal with the issues in his life, and because he was willing to do so, he was able to be used even after the failures and mistakes of his life. Notice David's response in Psalm 51, verses 1 through 3. This is how David responded when he realized he'd made mistakes. He writes a prayer to God, and I want you to notice how personal this prayer is. Have mercy on me. Notice the, the pronoun there, me. Have mercy on me, not somebody else, not what they did to me, not their fault. No, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sins, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Do you notice the difference between Saul and David? Saul was pointing his finger at other people and blaming other people and making up reasons for why he was not willing to do what God had asked him to do with his life. But David comes to the place of saying, no, it's me, God. It's, it's my transgressions. It's my iniquity. It's my sin. It's my failure. It's something that I've got to own up to you about God and, and take responsibility for in his life. And because he owned it, he experienced God's mercy. He experienced God's grace. He, he experienced God's forgiveness. He experienced God's recovery in his life. He writes about this in Psalm 32, the first two verses, the Passion Translation. How happy and fulfilled are those whose rebellion has been forgiven, those whose sins are covered by blood. How blessed and relieved are those who have confessed their corruption to God, for he wipes their slates clean and removes hypocrisy from their hearts. See, this is a problem we all have. There are things that get in the way of our stewardship, that get in the way of our being the people that God wants us to be. And oftentimes it's just that blame. It's wanting to point the finger at somebody else and say, it's, it's not me, God. It's them, God. It's not my fault. It's their fault. And we tend to miss out on huge, huge dimensions of recovery in our lives because we're always pointing the finger at others. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. I'm not going to read it for you, but you know the story. Adam and Eve had sinned against God, and after they sinned against God, their eyes were opened. They realized they were naked, and they became very much afraid, and so they sewed the fig leaves together, and they began to hide from God, and God comes into the garden looking for Adam and Eve and calls on Adam, where are you? And finally, there's this moment that Adam and Eve are brought into the presence of God after their sin, and so... In essence, God brings them to a place of saying, let's deal with this. And, 
And in that moment, God says, Adam, what about this? And Adam's response was, instead of saying, God, I really failed and messed up or didn't do what you asked me to do. Do you remember what Adam did? Adam said, well, it's Eve. It's her fault. She gave me that, that fruit and I ate of it. It's not me, God. It's her. So God turns his attention to, to Eve and says, Eve, Eve, how about you? How are you going to deal with this? And you're like, how, how are you going to deal with how you manage what I gave you? How are you going to deal with, with where, what you did in the garden where I placed you? And Eve, instead of owning responsibility, said, well, it was the serpent's fault. He's the one that tempted me. And so they're blame shifting all along. And so often that is the very thing that keeps us from being able to experience recovery in our lives. We get angry. We get bitter. We, get, we, get, uh, we, we become resentful toward other people. We blame shift and we make excuses for our lives. We deny and we defend and we deflect and we dismiss and we, we disregard what God's trying to deal with us about. And so we push it away and so we miss. It becomes an obstacle, an obstacle to all that God wants to do inside of us. Your life is your life, but to live your life well, to have recovery in your life, you have to own the responsibility and you have to push away the obstacles that want to rob you of that responsibility to, to own your life in the way that you need to before God. And that requires great humility. And when you and I humble ourselves as David did, some wonderful things happen in our lives. James 4, 6 says, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor or gives grace, one translation says, to the humble. James 4, verse 10, just a few verses later, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. There are plenty of obstacles that can get in the way of your, your proper life ownership. It, again, could be your anger. It could be your blame. It could be your resentment. It could be your bitterness. It could be your excuses. But all those things stand in the way of you being able to experience the recovery that God has in store for your life. They will always, anytime you and I hold on to anger or hold on to resentment or hold on to bitterness or hold on to excuses, they always move us away from recovery instead of toward recovery. And when you and I begin to deal with these obstacles and make a decision to do so, they move us toward the recovery God has in store for our lives. Here's my third and final point today. Recovery requires ownership of your recovery. Now, this phrase I'm giving you that, re, that, reco that recovery requires ownership of your recovery may sound redundant. I get that, but I, I'm going to make the point anyway because these words are very important. Let me say them again. Recovery requires ownership of your recovery. One more time. Recovery, think about it with me for a moment. Recovery requires ownership of your recovery. If you want recovery, you got to go after it. If you want recovery, you have to accept responsibility to actually go after the recovery. It's not just going to come to you. You have to go after it. Now, God will meet you, as we'll see here in just a moment, but you and I have to actually go after it. Let me give you one example of this in the Bible. I love this story. It's found in Mark chapter 10. It's a story of a man by the name of Bartimaeus. You should remember this story for the rest of your life. It's a valuable story. Because it teaches us a lot of things about how, how God brings recovery to our lives. Matthew, or excuse me, Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 46. Then they came to Jericho, the they refers there to Jesus and his disciples. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city that is leaving the city of Jericho, a blind man, notice this, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. So here's the story. Jesus and his disciples had been in Jericho. They'd spent some time there. And now Jesus is leaving Jericho with his disciples. And most likely there was a large group of people following them out of the city. And sitting by the roadside on the way out of the city of Jericho was a blind beggar by the name of Bartimaeus. He was a man that most likely was, 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 was brought there or made his way to that roadside every day to beg for the alms necessary to sustain his life. So there he is sitting by the roadside. Notice verse 47. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, notice what happens here. Somebody said, hey, Jesus is coming. Jesus of Nazareth is coming. And so obviously he couldn't see, but he could still hear. And so he heard that Jesus was coming. And notice what he does. He began to shout. 
Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So he began to shout this over and over again. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. We don't know how many times he would have shouted it until something happened that's described in verse 48. Many rebuked him and and told him to be quiet. Finally, somebody said, hey, Bartimaeus, just be quiet. Stop all this shouting. He's not going to pay any attention to you. You just got to quit this. You don't need to say anything else. Stop the shouting. You're irritating me by continuing to shout. And the crowd told him to be quiet. Everybody says, just shut up. Shut your mouth, Bartimaeus. Don't say that anymore. But I love what happened. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So as soon as they tried to quiet him, he just ramped up his cry. He took it to another level. He began to cry all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I want you to see this desperate cry on the part of Bartimaeus. He's showing responsibility. He's showing a desire to get into the presence of Jesus for something to happen in his life. He shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. I love this. Verse 49, Jesus stopped and said, call him. Isn't that great? See, he had been calling to Jesus. Now Jesus said, call him to me. I love that. So you can't call on Jesus without Jesus wanting to respond and call you to him. Call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Now think about that. He's been crying. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And and finally, he's in the presence of Jesus. And Jesus says to him, "What, what do you want me to do for you, Bartimaeus? What are you crying out for? What do you need in your life? What are you so desperate about? What are you looking for? What are you longing for from me? What do you want me to do for you? It wasn't a a question of rebuke. It was a question of compassion. What do you want me to do for you, Bartimaeus? I've heard your cry. What is it that you're desiring? It wasn't as though Jesus didn't know what the man needed. He wanted Bartimaeus to articulate what he needed in his life. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. I love that. Perhaps your cry to Jesus today is this, Jesus, I I want to be recovered. I've lost some things in my life that I didn't want to lose, and I've I've forfeited some things. that I didn't want to forfeit, so the devil has stolen some things from me that that, that I I want back again. I don't want to just come back. I want to come back to better. What do you want, Bartimaeus? What do you want? Put your name right there. What do you want me to do for you? I want recovery. I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately you received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. What a great story because it's the story of a man who took responsibility for his recovery. He said, I'm not going to be satisfied because I know that Jesus can do what he's done for others. He can do it for me. And Over the years, over the centuries, over the millennia, Jesus has recovered so many lives. He's recovered people from places that you and I could never have imagined. He's recovered you and me from places in our life that are so desperate. He's done it in your past. He'll do it for you now. You need to remember... The very thing that Bartimaeus really instinctively remembered in his own life is found in James chapter 4, verse 8. Why don't you read it together with me as we are concluding today's message? Come on, let's read together. Wherever you are, it doesn't matter right now. Would you read it out loud with me? I want you to hear this promise. I want you to hear yourself saying this promise. And when you draw close to God, God will draw close to you. Can we change that? I want you to take one little word and and. We're not going to violate the scriptures at all, but just take one little word because the you can become me. And that's all I want to ask you to do. And when, or I here, when I draw close to God, God will draw close to me. Say it with me. When I draw close to God, God will draw close to me. Notice John chapter 6, verse 37. Jesus makes a statement. All who come to me, I will embrace and will never turn them away. We're learning today that ownership is a part of recovery. Your life is your life. You have responsibility for the life that God has given to you, the love that he's shown you, the plans he has for you. 
So often things get in the way. There are obstacles that get in the way of our recovery and get in the way of our ownership of life. We want to be angry about something and resentful towards someone. And we want to blame somebody else and make all these excuses. But God says, no, 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 no. That's just an obstacle. And recovery starts to happen when we take ownership for that recovery like Bartimaeus. We cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And nothing keeps us from pursuing that recovery. Remembering that when I draw close to God, God will draw close to me. And all that come to Jesus, he says, I will embrace and I will never turn them away. Are you ready to own? Are you ready to take that step in your life toward recovery? I believe that you are today. I believe that's the reason you're watching is because you're, you're ready to recover in your life. And that's what you want to say to Jesus today. I, I want to see. I want recovery in my life. So would you join me as we pray together? Father, we're so very grateful for your word today. We're so thankful for the wonderful gift of life that you've given to us. Lord, we cannot imagine just that great gift. And we're so thankful for it. We're thankful, Lord God, that you love us with a love that goes beyond anything that we can even imagine. You have a plan and a purpose for our lives. You've called us to steward that and to steward it well. But Lord, we want to confess today that so often we've let things get in the way of good management of our life and things that have come into our lives that we should not have let let in or things that we've allowed to be a part of our life that, Lord, we should have walked away from. But Lord, we know that you're a gracious and kind and forgiving God. And so, Lord, we come today asking your cleansing, asking your forgiveness, asking for your restoration, asking for your recovery, O God. We ask, even as Bartimaeus cried out, Son of David, have mercy on me. We say, Jesus, have mercy on us today. We thank you for the promise of your word that says that if we will draw close to you, that you will draw close to us, and that anyone that comes to you that you will never cast out, that you will always embrace, you will never turn them away. So Lord, begin that process of good ownership in our life today so that recovery can be something we experience as we head into this year and the years, the decades, Lord willing to come. We ask it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. I would like to close today by giving you an opportunity to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me right now? Right where you are, just simply bow your head with me, and I'm going to give you a prayer to pray. And you can simply speak this prayer out, whisper this prayer out, and from the sincerity of your heart, call upon God, and I promise you that He will hear and answer you. So let's pray together. Start by simply whispering the name Jesus. Let there come uh, from your heart just the declaration of His name. Say, Jesus... I know that that I am a sinner, that I have fallen short with you. I'm sorry for all of my sins. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you are God's Son. I believe that you are the Savior of the world. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the grave, that you are alive today. Now pray these words. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Give me a new start in you. I commit my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, I want to encourage you with a promise from God's Word that says that when we call upon God's name, we call upon the Son of God, there is salvation that comes to our lives. He changes us from the inside out, and you become a new creation. All things pass away. All things become new. And that's exactly what has happened to you today. Your next step really is to make sure that you get into a good Bible-believing church. And you begin to study God's Word, get God's Word in you, and to make sure that you get a copy of the Bible if you don't have one and begin to read it. Spend some time every day in prayer. And I would encourage you also to check out the resources on our website that will help you to get going in your relationship with Jesus. You can find them at church-redeemer.org. Get those into your hands. Get started in your new life with Jesus Christ. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.